There we go. Thank you, Stella. Uh, so again, you know, we're celebrating um, Passion Week or, or Holy Week. We've been celebrating that. The church has for 1,900 years. And we've been doing that every year for 1,900 years because this thing is monumental. It's a big deal. It's changed the course of history. It's changed the course of life for uh, millions of, of people over the period of 1,900 years. And I'm one of them. You guys are, are on Zoom. You're one of them. You, many of you that are on Facebook, uh, you're one of the millions. And someday we're going to get to heaven and there's going to be you know, it's interesting because there's going to be a lot of people there, but then we're also going to discover there's going to be a lot of people that we would have liked to be there, but they're not there. And that is because they didn't respond to the events of Good Friday the way the rest of us did. And it's going to be uh, very sad, but the Bible says that in heaven, there'll be no more tears. I don't understand how that could be. Maybe we're going to forget these people and the sad events that took place in their, their eternal future. And we're just going to be focused on the throne. I don't know. But I know that that's a reality. Not everybody is going to go to heaven. Good morning, Olivia. Not because God didn't want it that way, but because of the choices we made or didn't make. And so we celebrate uh passion week or, or holy week every year because we don't want to forget and we haven't forgotten and, and that's good but you know sometimes when we celebrate things annually they seem to no matter how special they are they seem to lose a little bit of excitement along the way and sometimes hope can can wear off it just gets dull you know like a like a new puppy i don't know you guys are dog lovers we've always had uh dogs in our family and we like to get them when they're puppies and you love your puppy and you pay a lot of attention to your puppy and you want to feed the puppy all the time and you want to take the puppy to the park and take the puppy driving around with you and the whole thing but then the puppy after a while is not a puppy anymore it's a grown dog and the, the excitement has worn off, you know, and you say, hey, hey, get off of the bed. What are you, why are you on the bed? You know, get outside. Why is the dog in the house? You know, and oh man, the dog is hungry again. And the excitement wears off, you know, or like a new car, you buy a new car. It's got the new car smell. And hey, make sure when you get in the car, you don't have any pencils or pens in your back pocket. Hey, clean your shoes, man. Clean your shoes. I just washed the car, you know, armor on the. But then after 18 months, a couple of years, all the sheen has worn off and you're stuck with the car payment and uh, the excitement uh, is just no more. Well, those are puppies and cars. Those are worldly things. Those are temporal things. But Holy Week is different because we're talking now about eternal things and, um, you know, how we respond to the things that took place on, on, on Good Friday will determine actually where we spend eternity. And I get a little frustrated. Jack knows I've shared it with him many times. How people uh, come into the rooms of recovery and they work the steps and they do some things and get a sponsor. They become very active and that's great. But somehow in all of that, too many of them think that they can now, that there's this range of options to choose from. And that is where the problem, a major problem begins because Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so people who start to believe for lots of reasons that there's all of these options, 10,000 roads to heaven, you know, those are the people who unfortunately are going to spend eternity in hell. Hell is nowhere near a nice place. It's beyond uncomfortable. And you say, well, I don't like that. See, I don't like, that's, that's why I don't get on this Bible study because Mario talks about hell and, and other people. And, and I'm not down with that. I, I like to go to, I like Joel Olstein. He never talks about hell. He never talks about sin. I, that, see, I want to be encouraged that way. Well, the fact of the matter is Jesus himself spoke more about hell than he did heaven because it's, it's a reality. And so Jesus, those of us today, who understand that reality, we're waving red flags all the time. 
Listen, detour, don't go that way. Listen to what Jesus said. To say that he said anything other than that is to call Jesus a liar, and Jesus is not a liar. So we're always waving the red flags. It's not to hurt anybody's feelings. It's to ward people off from going in that direction. Well, <clears throat> let's go ahead and look more at Palm Sunday. I'm sorry, at uh, Good at Passion Week or Holy Week. It starts with Palm Sunday. And so if you went to uh, church last week on Sunday, uh, hopefully the pastor talked about uh, Palm Sunday. And on Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And in Luke 19, verse 38, um, you read there that when he rode in on the donkey, people were putting palm leaves uh, on the ground. They were putting their clothes on the ground. They had cleared the road. And that's what they did for kings in those days. And uh, the people, large, massive group of people, remember they were there celebrating not Good Friday or not Palm Sunday, but uh, uh, the Passover, the beginning of Passover. And so there were some scholars estimate more than a million people in the old city of Jerusalem. And it's not a big city where square miles are concerned. So a lot of people packed into a small place. Well, these people welcomed Jesus by putting the palm leaves down and the clothing down on the ground. And they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And that was not by coincidence. Uh, 600 years prior to that very day in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 and 26, the archangel Gabriel spoke with Daniel and he gave Daniel 600 years in advance the exact day when Jesus would be on that Palm Sunday road. And so this whole thing was planned out. Uh, so the archangel Gabriel told Daniel when this event would take place. And in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, an angel told Zechariah how it would take place. And in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, God gave Zechariah this prophecy and he wrote it down. He said, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation lowly and riding on a donkey, the foal of a donkey. 500 years before the event took place, God had the whole thing mapped out. And there were a few people there who had been paying attention and they looked at their wristwatch and they looked at their calendar and they said, here it is. And this is the man. 100% God, 100% man who came to save us from the sin. Most people didn't know because most people weren't paying attention because most people don't read their Bibles because most people don't go to a church where the pastor commits to teach them the whole Bible. Imagine in those days going to a synagogue where the rabbi said, you know, I don't like the book of Daniel because it offends my congregation. I don't like the book of Zechariah because it offends my congregation. Well, listen, those are the people who missed it when Jesus came the first time. And you know what? There are a lot of churches like that today and a lot of pastors like that today. And they are ministering to a congregation that is going to miss Jesus the second time. A lot of people missed him the first time. A lot of people are going to miss him the second time for a failure of understanding, taking the time to study the Bible. And it's not going to be good. You guys know we've talked about it before. The rapture is coming. It's a real thing that is going to happen on one day. And a lot of people are going to miss it. And they're going to be very sorry that they did. A lot of people will get saved, I would imagine. But they're going to have to go through hell here on earth, uh, giving their life to the Lord. Well, the question, I guess, then is, why did the Bible tell us when and tell us how hundreds of years in advance? Well, so that when it happened, people would know that Jesus is not only the Son of God, but that they would trust in the work that he came to do. That's why God put the word out hundreds of years 
in advance so that people would understand that our God, I don't know about all the other gods. You know, if you talk to people about God today, you have to mention Jesus. You have to mention the Bible because they are talking. There's so many conversations about so many different gods today. I, my wife and I were in, in downtown Los Angeles very late last night having dinner with another pastor and his wife. And I'm telling you, it is crazy in downtown LA. Now, I, I'm, a, I'm a heroin addict. I, I did a lot of messing around in that area back in the day and it was bad then but it was nothing then like it is now it's absolutely crazy and there's people there that are doing the craziest things it'll tell you all about god but it's some other god and so the thing about our god and about our bible is that god means what he says and he says what he means all of the promises he made he will fulfill he will not be called a liar not our god not our god so here we go we move from palm sunday to wednesday and wednesday is when we recall the last supper and uh, judas betrayal of, of jesus and that's in luke chapter 22 verse 21 um, and the disciples of course are sitting around the table and all of them wonder if the person who would betray Jesus was they themselves, they doubted themselves. And by this time, I guess they understood the depths of their sins and what they were capable of. And they started asking, Lord, is it, is it I? Am I going to betray you? And then, of course, Jesus said, no. He says, well, let me read it to you. He said, behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And so this was determined, again, 500 years prior in Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. Told us exactly what Judas would do. And the price that would be paid for him to betray Jesus. Uh, 30 pieces of silver. So all of this was not by coincidence. Uh, God didn't wake up one morning and think this through. It went on from the beginning. Well, after Wednesday, then comes Good Friday. And that's what we're going to talk about. Because on Good Friday, Jesus paid the ultimate price for a debt he did not owe. Whose debt was it? It was my debt. It was your debt. It was actually the debt of everybody in the world. But not everybody in the world is going to accept that idea. So those who come to Jesus have their debt paid. Those who don't, unfortunately, they owe a debt. And what is the debt? Well, in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages, that is the payment due for sin, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So... On Good Friday, Jesus is brutally punished, not a little bit. If you ever go with us to Israel, you're going to see we walk down the road that Jesus would have walked uh, from Jerusalem, where he had been tormented, all the way to Calvary. And uh, we do a little in-depth study as we make our way. By the way, we're going in February. I hope you guys will come with it. Don't let fear stand in your way. Don't let fear and fear of finance and fear of what you see on the media. Somebody posted something. Oh, Israel's at war. I've been to Israel six times. Every single time I've gone, they said, Israel's at war. And it just, you know, it's a lot of people trying to put fear into you because that trip will change your life totally. But Jesus was brutally punished. And he was brutally punished, tormented, persecuted uh, because of our sinful thoughts, our sinful uh, words, and our sinful deeds. That's why he was punished. Not because he was guilty of anything. And you know, it had to be that way. Jesus had to come to earth in the body of a man because God is holy. Our God is holy. Our God is perfect in every way. He is the epitome of perfection. 
Well, what happens when you have perfection is perfection cannot be compromised. If, if, if perfection is compromised, it's no longer perfection. It's flawed now. And so sin has to be judged. If our God is perfect, then sin has to be judged. If he's not going to judge sin, he cannot call himself perfect. And if he's not going to be perfect, listen, he can't be our God because then he becomes just like us and he can't have that. So now God has a problem. God has a problem. What's his problem? His problem is that he loves us so much, <clears throat> but he cannot have fellowship with us because God can't have fellowship where sin is present. And this is what I tell so many people in 12-step recovery who just want to wink away sin. You know, I, I, I work my ninth step. It's over now. Listen, maybe between you and some people, it's over. But God is perfect. God is holy. He can't just wink away sin. Listen, I love you, so it's okay. No, the sin must be judged if God is going to continue in the character that he is in. So sin separates us from him. Uh, Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> and I'm reading this out of the New Living Testament. <clears throat> Isaiah writes there, he says, listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to hear you call. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. Your hands are the hands of murderers. Oh, here's your bill. Oh, I'm not a murderer. I've done a lot of things. I'm not a murderer. Well, hold on. And your fingers are filthy with sin. Your lips are full of lies and your mouth spews corruption. Wow. God has a problem. But God is <clears throat> so wise. <clears throat> Those of us who've been walking with the Lord for a while, we have seen God figure out in a masterful way problems that we just could not figure out. <clears throat> and so God has a problem, but Jesus is the solution. So what does God do? Well, in order for God to remain perfect, in order for God to have fellowship with sinners, he sends to earth in the form of a man, his sinless son. For what? Well, first to teach us, but second, to be judged, to be punished, and to die in our place. So in the Old Testament, there are laws. God put those laws into place. And it's not just the Ten Commandments. There's a lot of other laws. Well, one of the laws was that if a man were willing to die in the place of another man who was a slave, that slave could be freed. So God created that law along with others. God cannot violate his own law. That would make him, you know, those are the worst of the worst. How do you feel? When we discover that there is a crooked cop taking payment, doing corrupt things, but he's wearing a badge and he's wearing the uniform. Those are the people are the worst of the worst. Well, God is not going to be that. So somebody had to die in our place, but it couldn't just be somebody. It had to be somebody who was not guilty of any sin. And nobody but nobody could ever fit that description but Jesus Christ, who was born of a virgin. We were born into sin. Jesus was not born into sin. He was born of a virgin. Joseph was not his father. God Almighty was his father. And so with that plan, again, God remains perfect. We are forgiven, those who receive Christ. And of course, now God can have the fellowship that intimate fellowship with us that he always wanted through Christ. Well, turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And we're going to talk about some of the details of uh, Good Friday. We like to go in depth here in this uh, Bible study because we think it's important, especially when that's not taking place very often these days. So look at 22, 
Luke 22, and we're going to pick it up in verse 63. It says, now, <clears throat> these are the events that took place on Good Friday. Now the men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him. And having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, prophesy. Who's the one who struck you? And many other things they blasphemously spoke against him. As soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. They couldn't let him go. If they would have said, let him go, let him go, they still couldn't let him go because all of this had already been prophesied by God. It had to happen this way. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they all said, are you the Son of God? So he said to them, you rightly say that I am. They were correct. They're going to say a lot of screwed up things, but on that point, they were exactly right. And then look at Luke uh, chapter 23, verse 1. Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. So now they take him to Pontius Pilate, who was the, gov the Roman governor at that time. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Question, was Jesus guilty of perverting the nation, of forbidding to pay taxes? Absolutely not. These were outright lies. These were false accusations. Who has perverted the nation? Oh, the devil, the devil did it. No, listen. Put on your alligator skin now, okay? This is offensive. Jesus did not do anything to pervert a nation, but you and I did. You and I did. Listen, some of the most famous words of the alcoholic and the addict of the fornicator is, leave me alone. I'm not hurting anybody but myself. Not so. Not so. You are infecting entire families and fire entire neighborhoods. You are infecting the, the penal code, you, you, you are, you have become a, a, a cancer metastasized. Our stuff, our sin affects everybody. You say, well, I didn't rape anybody. The girl wanted to have sex with me, so we enjoyed sex. It's called fornication in the Bible. And it has a great ripple effect. It's why we have so many sexually transmitted diseases today. You know, when we became liberal with fornication, that is what led to homosexuality, lesbianism, the whole transgender thing. See, sin, just like alcoholism, just like drug addiction, which is also sin, is progressive. It doesn't just stay parked. There's no neutral gear. You know, when I was 17 years old, I had a girlfriend. I think I met her when we were 15. And we didn't know the Lord. We just, we felt like having sex. We just had sex. We enjoyed sex. And we did that for a while. And then she got pregnant. And uh, we decided that we were not ready for that. So we went and, uh, and we had an abortion. And um, that affected her. That affected me. And that affected the, the, the baby. Well, she got pregnant again. And by this time, I had been using heroin, a, 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 you know, full-on uh, addiction. And uh, she decided that she was going to have the baby without me. And so, good morning, Phil. And so, the, uh, the baby was born. And I did not know that I was a, a father uh, at the time. And it went on until he was 21 years old. I, I didn't know of him. I'd never met him until he was 21 years old. Do you think that had an effect on my son? It most certainly did. In fact, if you know anything about United States prisons where the men are concerned, 80% of the men incarcerated grew up in a fatherless home. And that is not a coincidence. And so when we... 
sin, when we fornicate, mess around with drugs, alcohol, gangs, violence, all of these different things, listen, we participate in polluting the entire nation and our nation, speaking of the United States, I don't know, England, Sweden, I don't know, but in the United States, I can tell you that our country is sadly polluted by the sins of so many people. Oh no, we perverted a nation, but Jesus did not. And how about paying taxes? Did Jesus ever say, listen, the Roman government is so corrupt. Don't pay your taxes. No, he didn't say that. In Matthew 17, verse 27, when it came time to pay the annual tax, Jesus told Peter, lest we offend them, Peter, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and for you. Listen, not only did Jesus pay taxes, he paid triple taxes. He paid his tax. He paid Peter's tax. And if you and I have cheated on our taxes, don't raise your hand. But if you cheated on your taxes, listen, that's a sin. And Jesus died for that sin too. Oh yeah. I said, don't raise your hand because I don't know if you know this, but your president is throwing $80 billion to the IRS to audit everybody. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're going to take full, full control. So pay your taxes. You'll be obeying your government and you'll be obeying uh, Jesus. Verse 3, uh, Luke 23, verse 3. Then Pilate asked him, saying, are you king of the Jews? And he answered and said, it is as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no fault in this man. But they were more fierce, saying, he stirs up the people teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from, Ju uh, from, Gal from beginning, all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. Now here, Jesus is guilty. No doubt about it. Jesus is guilty where this is concerned. He did stir up people teaching from Judea to Galilee. And listen, those who listened and those who applied his teaching had their lives amazingly transformed. You say, Mara, how do you know that? You weren't there because his teaching has transformed my life. And his teachings has transformed the lives of so many people that I know. His teaching being the word of God and the study of the word of God. I don't know about all the hyper Pentecostal hallelujah. I guess that's good. I guess hey, nothing wrong with being emotional about Jesus, but the word is where it's at. If you're wanting transformation in your life, the word of God is where it's at. You say, Mario, I'm in a 12 step program. I work the 12 steps and I have transformation in my life. I'm not going to argue with you. You, you. you most certainly did. But it's not spiritual. It's not eternal. That's why those 12 steps have been pointing, have been directing you to the book that they came from, because that is what's going to bring you transformation in a way that is just super dimensional. It's eternal. It's heavenly. It's going to give you a kingdom mindset is what it's going to do. 12 steps alone, they're not going to do that for you. Ain't going to happen. And if you're not careful, those 12 steps will lead you down some other path to worship some other God. Keep it in its context. Keep it in its context. Verse 13. Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people, and indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him, and indeed, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him, for it was necessary for him to release one to them at the feast. We'll talk about that in a minute. Very important. Verse 18. And they all cried out at once saying, away with this man. That is Jesus. And release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. That's Barabbas. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus again, called out to them. But they shouted, saying, crucify him, crucify him. Then he said to them the third time, 
Why? What evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and of the chief priest prevailed. So Pontius Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released them to the one they requested who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison. But he delivered Jesus to their will. One of the things here that is most interesting to me is that just six days prior to Good Friday, this same crowd of people in Luke chapter 19 are the same crowd of people that were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And I say to myself, if I would have been there, I would have shouted back. And I would have said, don't you say that about my Jesus. Come over here. Tell me that to my face. Say it. But you know what? Truth be told. Truth. I, I could not have been this honest with myself prior to knowing Christ. But now knowing Christ, truth be told, the depth of my sin is so much that I guarantee I would have been one of those people shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Because we are very dark. I think it's Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The Lord tells us there that our hearts are desperately wicked, thinking of evil all day long. Do you know who Jeremiah is writing to? He's writing to God's people. He's not writing to pagan people. He's writing to God's people. So still, we have hearts that way. Oh, God is in the process of, of transforming our lives. No doubt about it. But sin is always so close to the surface. That's just who we are. And it's why we desperately need Christ. Well, <clears throat> to keep the peace in Israel, Rome had a custom. And not only in Israel, I would imagine in other uh, countries that they uh, had power over, they had a custom. And that is that they, when they had two criminals that were guilty, they would release one and punish one. And hopefully this way, there wouldn't be a riot. And so that's what uh, Pontius Pilate is offering the people here. He says, look, we have Jesus, who's, I, I, he, Pontius Pilate said it, he's not guilty of any crime. And then we have Barabbas, who is a murderer. As we have it in Roman custom, we will release one to you. Who will it be? Give us Barabbas, they said, the murderer. Give us Barabbas, the murderer. Why did it come down this way? We mentioned earlier, all the events of Good Friday were all planned out by God hundreds of years beforehand. Why would God have allowed Barabbas? And notice in verse 25, Barabbas' name is not mentioned. That, that strikes. When you come to the place that you understand that every word in the Bible is there by the design of the Holy Spirit, then you understand that every word means something. Every name and the definition of that name is speaking to us. So Barabbas is mentioned in verse 18. But in verse 25, Referring to Barabbas, his name is not there. Why is that? Well, I believe it's because Barabbas is a picture of who we are. And here's where they say, Mario, I'm guilty of fornication. I, I've even, you know, I've even experimented with lesbianism, homosexuality, and, and I've been violent. I, I used to belong to a gang. And I and greedy, cheating on me. I've done all that, but Mario, wait a minute. I've never killed anybody. I, I, I've heard that so many times from people. And I get it. It's the conviction. But we have to remember what the Word of God says. And we have to believe the Word of God more than our own experience. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, Jesus says that if we were ever angry, with a brother or a sister, without cause, we are guilty of murder. 
That's what Jesus said. I'm not going to argue. If you want to argue with Jesus, you can argue with Jesus. I'm done arguing with Jesus. So in my mind, that makes us all murderers. But listen, it doesn't end there. It's part of a beautiful story because just as Barabbas, the murderer, was set free, so we too are set free. We're set free. Jesus stays behind to be brutally punished and crucified. We are set free. Well, at this point, the Bible tells us that Jesus is on his way walking to Calvary's hill, a uh, hill where he's going to be, uh, or actually he's already been beaten. He's all full of, of blood. And probably worst of all at this point, he's being mocked on that road. They're hurling insults at him. Probably insults like they were talking when he was a little boy in Nazareth. There goes that kid. Everybody says he's a special kid. But you know what the secret is? Nobody knows who his father is. Joseph's not his father. No, see, his mother, Mary, oh, she was a virgin. No, she was messing around. She got pregnant, had this kid. Oh, now the kid is special. Many people were referring to Jesus as a bastard when he was a little boy. Listen, you think you have it rough? Jesus had it rough, man. And he was not deserving of any of those slanderous remarks or the mocking. So he's walking along. Crown of thorns on his head, thoroughly whipped. His, 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 his flesh is open. He's bloodied. And now they're hurling insults. And listen, they're even spitting on him. Jesus. And then, finally, when they get to the top of Calvary, they crucify him. Put the nails through his hands and his feet. They raise that cross. And he's there now for everybody to see crucified naked in front of his mother and everybody, total humiliation. But then in verse 32, it says, there were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And then go down to verse 39 there, Luke 23, verse 39. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive due reward for our deeds. You say, listen, we're guilty of thievery, okay? But he's not. He says, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And this really messes up the religious people. They say, how can that be? This guy to the left or the right, I don't know. He was a criminal. He'd never been to church. No church membership. You know, churches like, well, if you want to be a part of our church, we want you to sign this, that you're going to be a member. And you look at the fine print on the bottom, and being a member, you promise to give 10% of your income to this church. Be a member. Well, this guy wasn't a member. He'd never tithed in his whole life. He'd never been baptized. There's no record of him even saying the sinner's prayer. Nothing. Well, in regards to this guy, they're right. He had all of these things against him. No church membership, no sinner's prayer, no being baptized, never tithed, none of those things. But he had one thing in his favor that outweighed all of the other stuff. You know what that one thing was? He believed in the person and the work that Jesus did on Good Friday, 1900 years ago. And did you know that that is the only thing necessary for forgiveness and to have fellowship with God and to experience someday eternal salvation? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, <clears throat> as I was studying this, I thought about the difficulty that I had when I, I first asked Christ into my life. 
I I'd had no, I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't know anything about the Bible. Um, but in my mind, I said to myself, I can do this. Whatever the Christian people are doing, I, I can do this. I know I can do this. I'll, I'll be good. I'll be good. I'll, I'll start doing the right thing. And, you know, I, I, I'm not, I stopped using heroin. That, that was big. If I can do that, I, I can do this. You know, ever since I was a little boy, I had this mindset that whatever you or anybody else was doing, I could do it. What if, if they're building go-karts down the street, I could do it. I'll build a better go-kart. If they're climbing trees, I could climb a bigger tree and I'll do it faster than they can. I always had this in my mind. Now, whether or not that it was reality was another thing. When I first started using heroin, I said, listen, I won't be like these other guys, like my brother and all of these other guys. I won't be like that. I'll do it once in a while. Or listen, if it ever gets really bad, I'll just quit. I can quit. I can. I know they can't do it, but I can do it. I had this mindset about so many things. And I brought that mindset with me to my Christian experience. And it took me a long time to come to the place of, of honesty where I realized, Mario, you can't do it. You can't do it. You know, in the Bible... God uses angels and God uses men and women to accomplish all kinds of things. He gives us a responsibility to carry out. But then there are some things that are so big, that are so important. God says, can't use an angel, can't use a man. This is so big. This is so important. I must do this myself. And that's what happened when Jesus came to earth. You know, in, in, in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve fell and they brought sin into the world, that was so big. The ripple effects, it was catastrophic. We suffer from the decision they made 6,000 years later. We still suffer from it. It was a big deal. That was so big that God could not use an angel or a man to rectify the problem. So the Bible says that Adam and Eve covered themselves with leaves, probably fig leaves. But then God himself, he didn't send a man, he didn't send an angel. God himself shed blood of an animal someplace, somewhere. And he brought the skins of the animal and told Adam and Eve, cover yourself with this. It was too big. But it was also a picture of what God would do on Good Friday 4,000 years later. There's something, when, when the flood came, God had to, he didn't want to, but he had to destroy billions of people on the earth. And he said, no, you build the ark. But when the flood comes, I have to be the one to shut the door. Yeah, there's some things that are so big, so important that God has to do on themselves. And that is what Christ did on Good Friday. It was too big. You and I could not accomplish anything like that. Not to save yourself, certainly not to save the world. No way. God stepped in and he did it. And we have to accept that. And how dare we think that we can add to that or take away from that? We, that is blasphemous. That is blasphemous. I'm going to make myself better. I'm going to hire a life coach. I'm going to get a therapist. I'm going to work the steps 500 times. I'm going to have two. I'm going to have an AA sponsor and I'm going to have an NA sponsor. And I'm going to see the doctors and I'm going to do all these things because darn it, I'm going to make myself better for God. Be careful. Because if that is the reality, Jesus did everything that he did for nothing. For nothing. It's blasphemous. No, listen. We have to receive our brokenness. We have to come to terms with that. And we have to receive the beautiful, tender love of God. Then and only then can Good Friday, the crucifixion, Resurrection Sunday, then and only then can that mean what it actually means. Then we can only, only if we do that, can we experience the depth. And so if you're not feeling Good Friday, if you're not feeling Easter, if you're not feeling Christmas, my guess, I'm betting everything, that you're doing something to try to improve on that, that you're doing something to add to that, and you're headed in the wrong direction. You'll never experience God the way he wants you to experience him. So 
It is because of that that we call this the gospel, the good news. And listen, the gospel gets better and then it gets better, all right? Because in Romans chapter 8, 32, highlight this in your Bible, write it on the front of your Bible. I, I'm getting my tattoos removed, but if you're a tattoo person, get this tattooed, okay? Romans chapter 8, verse 32. This is what it says. He, God, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You know what he's saying? When you have a need or you have a want, you have a desire, whatever it is, financial, career, marriage, having children, traveling, whatever it is. If you have a desire, if you have a want and you're praying to God, listen, don't doubt, don't doubt. God says, if I gave my son to go through all of that, is there anything that I would hold back from you? Any good thing at all? The answer is absolutely not. Understand who I am, God says. I mean what I say. I say what I mean. I keep all of my promises. And if you don't know by now, Good Friday, Easter, Christmas, if you don't know by now that I love you and how much I love you, there's nothing more that I could do. There's nothing more than I can say. So if you're not feeling that, pull back, man. Stop adding. Stop trying to improve yourself to make yourself good for God. He will do all of that. He will do all of that. So some people say, Mario, you know, you're really upset with the life coaches and the therapists. I am because they're confusing so much of what God has so simply done for us. I mean, when I say simply, it wasn't easy, but it's so simply laid out. And it's confusing people, which is exactly what Satan has intended to do from the beginning. We don't need any more of that. Well, it gets better again because today is Friday that we're talking about. Sunday is coming. And Jesus didn't just die. On Sunday morning, he resurrected himself. He pulled himself up from the grave. And that is the most amazing thing. The Bible says he is the first fruits of those who resurrected from the grave, meaning there's more coming. If he's the first fruit, there's more coming. Who are they? You and I. Because he was raised from the dead, you and I also are going to be raised from the dead. This is big, man. This is monumental. This is huge. And you know, if you look to share this with people who aren't believers, Chances are, the Bible says many of them are going to look at it as foolishness. But to us, we want to keep it so close to our heart, locked into our memory, because this is the greatest thing ever. Nothing ever, nothing, you'll never see anything greater than this or experience anything greater. Well, with that, I want to thank you guys for joining us. We talked about... Going into the book of Leviticus after Jude, we just finished an eight-week study of the book of Jude, uh, but some have suggested, and I'm leaning towards the book of Revelation, especially in light of so many things that are going on today that are the fulfillment of prophecy. So I think that's what we should do. Um, you know, pray about it and, and let me know. Um, but the book of, of uh, Revelation uh, as it pertains to uh, prophecy, so many things foretold thousands of years ago that we see happening in the world today. I think that's where we need to be. And uh, it's an eye opener for sure, man, for sure. Well, with that, let's pray. And then I'm going to dismiss you guys on Facebook. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Julie Portillo and Robert Medina. Uh, Phil Aguilar was with us. Chaplain Bob was with us. And a, a lot of other people. Roberta and uh, her sister. Roberta has a bunch of sisters. <laughs> Patricia. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, be back with us again next week.
uh, when we're going to be, I guess, entering into the book of Revelation, book that will blow your mind completely. Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, we say thank you for the gift of Jesus and all that that means to us. But Lord, we can't thank you enough. So what we can do is offer you our lives, and we, we want to do that. We offer you ourselves, Lord. But we're so filled with so many misconceptions, so many of the world's ways. And so we want to ask you to remove that so that we can be a gift that is satisfactory to you. It's what we want to do. We want to love you. We want to serve you according to your will, not our own. And Father, I pray for everybody on, on Facebook and, and on Zoom that this weekend we will sit back, contemplate, and just thoroughly enjoy the work that you did for us on the cross. Thank you so much for that. Now we look forward to Resurrection Sunday. And we look forward to spending all of eternity with you in heaven. Lord. Nothing better can even be imaginable, imagined. Lord, thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Facebook, goodbye. See you next week. All right. Uh, I, Stella had her hand up first. I, I saw it. I'm a witness to that. Recording. Go ahead, Stella. Recording. Thank you. You're on it, Stella.